It's a muggy day. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing today? I hope you're well. Now, <clears throat> I haven't done any gardening for quite a few days now, nearly a week. I've, <laughs> I've got my little satchel bag on my front with my string, my scissors, and my secateurs in to save me bending down. Um, yeah, I haven't done any gardening for a few days. Just been watering. Partly because I've just had another heat wave. <laughs> so hot. And I just thought, you know what? Um, <laughs> I'm done competing with the heat this year. So I get on with things indoors. Great. But of course, still watering. Now, just to say very quickly, because I know some of you have seen bits about this on the news. You know, it was not supposed to be this hot today. Never mind. Um, where are we now? It's Thursday. I always look at the forecast for the week ahead on a Sunday night. It just helps me to plan my week. What are going to be my garden days? What are going to be my at-home days? That sort of thing. So I saw the forecast and I was just so delighted because the forecast said rain all day Monday, rain all day Tuesday, thunderstorms, lightning and rain starting at 4am on Wednesday and going through the whole day. So the forecast basically said we we're going to have three days of rain, <coughs> which is <coughs> a little bit of a worry if it's heavy rain after drought because the ground can't take it. Anyway, let's drape that string there. So yes, you will have seen reports from the UK. Some areas have been flooded because, because the ground is so parched and rock hard. It was heavy, heavy rain in places. It just couldn't sink into the ground, so it's flooded. Awful. Meanwhile, over here, in my bit of London, zip. We had about two hours on Tuesday morning of the lightest rain possible. <laughs> it was so light it barely registered. But at the time, so I clocked when it started, and at the time I thought actually this is perfect, this is perfect rain because it's so light and gentle a whole day of this is going to prepare the ground for the heavy rain to come. Brilliant. <laughs> the only thing is, the heavy rain didn't come. And that little tiny bit of rain that we did have has done absolutely nothing. So <clears throat> I wasn't planning to be in the garden today, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to water. No two ways about it. Uh, and actually I want to have that one out. <laughs> it's so weird having it in my hand bag. While I'm here, I'm going to be doing some... Uh, well, the main thing today is the lavender harvest. So it's time to harvest and by harvesting I'll prune it. More of that later. But also, I haven't done any aspen spray on my tomatoes this year, which is something... I do as a sort of blight prevention. I haven't done much leaf clipping. I've really just let them get on. Obviously I'm tying them in and removing side shoots. But because I remain hopeful about rain, I am going to clip them a little bit today. The reason for that is to just make sure there's, a, oops, sorry, little truss, good air circulation so that if it does rain, that air moving around and through them can make sure the leaves dry off more quickly. Also, what I tend to do is cut my leaves in half. I'll remove all the bottom leaves completely, and then some of the upper ones, just cut them in half, just so there's less leaf surface area for blight spores to land on. But you know what, in all honesty, 
we now have no rain on the forecast again. So, where are we now? We had the second and third weeks of May, we had rain quite a lot. Since then, nothing. I'm not even going to count that stuff on Tuesday morning because it's done nothing for the ground. So it's pretty much, where are we now? It's three months. Three months of watering by hand. I'm so done with it. On my way here today, one of the reasons it's good afternoon and not good morning, it's taken me an hour to get here today because I kept bumping into friends on the high street and using my perching spots along the high street where I perch to rest my knees, having chats and a number of the one a number of the friends I bumped in to do it today are fellow gardeners and everyone's saying the same thing. Why didn't we get any rain? I'm sick of watering. It's just yeah, we're all done with it. By the way, can you see the Tommies? Well that one, they're getting towards six foot. Yay! Loads of trusses. First bit of fruit ripening. Oh, I'll show you that in a second. Right, I'm going to get this whole lot done. It'll take me a little while. Um, you know what, before I do, let me show you my first little bit of ripe stuff. Yay and hooray at last. So on this side, that's the first of my gardener's delight ripening. Oh, not quite there yet. Not quite there couple more in there and then upla let's come round because also just starting to ripen oh and threatening to split these are my Guernsey Island tomatoes that lovely marking with the, the sort of the green stripes on what will hopefully become red skins a little bit orange at the moment I mean, you can see, hopefully you can see, there's tons and tons of fruit. Yummo. But also, my little extras from Steve. So, oh, these are ripe. I've got, whoopla, I've got my first lovely orange cherries. Actually, they're a good size. Let me show you this one. Give a bit of shade so you can see. That's a good size. And then on the back, the black cherries are ripening too. Fab. Now I've never grown these before so I don't know I don't know when they're ripe or not. I guess I can taste one to see. This um just while I'm here crikey. It's warm again. It wasn't supposed to be like this but poor beans Poor, poor beans. Yeah, what a year. This is backing up, backing up, backing up. This is what a garden looks like when it's been in drought for three months. It's just about being kept alive with watering. Um, but really you know where's the green <laughs> where's the green going I mean look at my paths it's all just dust dust everywhere goodness me right well I'm going to get back to the tomatoes get them done and finished and then we can move on to the next thing well there seems to be Yet another day the forecasters have got wrong. I would have planned my day differently. <laughs> uh, it was supposed to be 22 degrees and cloudy today. It's 27. And you can see the sun's blazing down on me. Yeah, not, not ideal. Not what I was wanting. Right, before, yeah, I've done the tomatoes. Sorry, it's taken so long. I forgot that we even started there. Um, 
bit disconcerting. I'm gonna harvest the chickpeas. Now, it's the middle of August. Oh gosh, when a cloud does scud by, it's such a relief and a breeze. The chickpeas are normally something that I'd be harvesting September onwards. So green, for the green ones, maybe sort of from the beginning of September, keep an eye on them. Uh, for dried ones, end of September, going into October. They're going over. <laughs> it's actually, it feels like literally in the space of this last week or so, the garden suddenly feels like it's flipped into autumn. So one of the reasons I was saying a bit disconcerting is because it looks like I've got all this nice lush beans behind me, the Madeira maroon, Churchill black on the other side. It's all gigantes. They're all fur coat and no knickers. It's all leaf and no bean. There are so few beans and it's the heat. You know, the heat has been knocking the flowers off. Oh, I need my barrow a bit closer. Hang on, let me get my barrow. Um, yeah, the climbing beans have hated this year. They really don't do well in heat or drought. If it if we work woo sorry just get myself back. If we it's actually they can cope with heat. What they can't cope with is drought. They hate they hate being dry. Okay so sorry just quickly with the chickpeas you know what I'm doing. Just pulling the whole little plant up and then as I do every year just run my fingers down each branch which pulls the um, pods off. There's only a couple on here, it's a tiny little tiddly plant. They'll all come off. Let me show you one. Oh, <laughs> broken the plant. So they'll be at mixed stages between dry and green, but I just scrum them all off like that and then take them home to pod because it's quite a fiddly, a fiddly long job but it's the perfect job to do whilst I listen to some sport <laughs> such a great summer of sport so that's what I'm doing with the chickpeas as we chat yeah the beans um, they just they just can't cope with the with the dryness and like I said they can cope with a bit of heat but when I say a bit of heat I mean about you know the average British summer July, our top temperature average is 23, 24, I beg your pardon. August, our top average temperature is 23. So if that's the top average, that means that we do occasionally get 26, 27, you know, rarely, but sometimes 30. So in a normal year, um, they would just about manage. So last year, for instance, really, really wet, wet summer. Uh, but we were having our average warm temperatures so we were having these 23 24 days and lots of rain great great year for beans not great year for tomatoes obviously because of blight uh, so uh, you know what a dilemma what a dilemma I think a lot of us are in this year Firstly, for me to, to really not have any beans is, I'm going to use the D word, it is a disaster. They are my most important crop. It's my protein. So, I mean, to be honest, looking at what's there, I doubt there's enough beans to get me to Christmas. Never mind to see me through to August next year. It is not going to happen. I've still got quite a lot of beans in the freezer and dried beans from, actually some of the dried beans are from two years ago, so I'll ration those now. They're going to go on ration, um, not so rationed that I don't have them, <laughs> you know, that I don't have, I will eat as much as I need to eat in terms of for the protein, but I won't be greedy, I mean I love beans, 
I won't be greedy. I will have just enough to satisfy that protein in my diet and no more. So yeah, I think for anyone who, oh God, the farmers, I keep thinking about the farmers because their income depends on the crops as well. But you know, for anyone else who is trying to survive on what they grow, oh, scary year, isn't it? I keep saying it's the year to be grateful for whatever we do get. And I stand by that completely. However, I am, here I am. Our growing season, really, I should be kind of thinking of this season to the end of October. But already, here I am, it's the summer still, and I'm already thinking, right, <laughs> I'm going to be buying food. I'm going to be buying a lot of beans for example so I'll start doing a bit of research now I'll start to see you know I'll go to the various shops in my area um, look at the price of say tins of beans because tinned beans are so easy aren't they because they don't require soaking and boiling um, but obviously that's not bulk in a tin but the other thing is I will look at um, buying beans in, dry beans in bulk, however, you know where I'm going with this, however, don't you, is I don't really want to have pans on the stove boiling beans for half an hour, an hour, uh, because that's using fuel that I don't want to use. So something else I can think about is instead of buying beans, although I do love them, is to think more about using lentils instead because they cook much, much more quickly and they're going to still give me that, um, you know, really good hit of protein. And the other thing, and it's something I've, I've you know, talked about over the last couple of years, I've talked endlessly about it with our Paul, do we, do we start to think about changing what we grow? You know, we had, a, we had a drought, but not the same kind of heat during 2020 in lockdown year, when we were all out in the garden all day, every day. Um, yeah, it was a drought year, but it wasn't as hot. And I can remember, you know, talking with friends, talking with Paul after 2020 and saying, are we going to have to look at drought tolerant vegetables and I distinctly remember at the time saying maybe not because I'm willing to bet next year it's going to be wet again <laughs> typical British summer wet 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 and sure enough it was really wet last year it's a conundrum isn't it it's a conundrum because uh, you know it's definitely changing To grow. <laughs> I don't know what we're all going to be growing in the future. Um, ay, caramba. Ah, oh, I tell you what, while we're sat here and I'm doing this, because this keeps coming up in comments, the, <laughs> the lavender harvest might wait. Oh, and also just to say, where the chickpeas are coming out, I've got something to follow them. I'm not going to plant today, but I suddenly thought... Um, I've got all my celery plants. Now, the celery have been sat in those big, they're in, a, they're in trays, in a tray, but in those big bag for life type bags up by the shed. So they've been in dappled shade a lot. I've kept them watered. And in fact, at times I've kept, you know, I've put a centimetre or so of water into the tray that they're standing in because they are a bog plant. They don't mind having wet toes. They'd rather have wet toes than dry toes. If plants have toes, of course plants have toes. How would they wiggle in the soil otherwise? Um, so yeah, I think uh, I suddenly thought I can put the celery in here. Probably not gonna plant it today, but when I do, the other thing I will do once I plant it is I will put shade netting over it because we're still getting such, they won't enjoy this strong strong sun oh who's meowing oh it's rosie of course um 
Oh, also just to say with the chickpeas, sorry, I'm flitting around all over, aren't I? The green ones, it will be almost impossible not to eat half of them as I pod. Lovely, lovely snack. Sometimes if there's enough green ones, I think to be honest, this year they're mostly going to be going towards dry. But if there's enough, I just freeze them. Literally just get them out of the pods, chuck them in some Tupperware trays, whack them in the freezer. I don't do anything else with them. And then when I come to use them, they don't take very long at all. Maybe just a five minute steam, <coughs> excuse me, to take the frost out of them. And then chuck them in a curry. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. Yum, yum, yum. Ah, so yeah, so that was the thing I suddenly thought about whilst we're here, as the bucket gradually starts to fill. It's come up quite a few times in comments. People have been asking, have I thought about when I move, I'm going to snudge up closer. Hold on. Oopla. When I move, and wherever I move to, I mean, please, please, please let there be a garden. I have vegetable growing in my soul. I can't live without it. Um, but I definitely don't want a big garden. Someone was saying to me, why didn't I, you know, if I moved to the countryside, I could get three acres and then I could have my own chickens and this and that and da, da, da. I was thinking, three acres, are you kidding me? My grandparents' back garden was a third half an acre and I don't think I could manage that even anyway so it will almost it will almost certainly be quite a small garden because it will almost certainly be a, a garden outside of a ground floor flat and it's quite possible that the garden will be divided in two so that the upstairs flat gets half the garden that's very common in London very commonly they're divided down the down the length so you get a long skinny garden i don't care just as long as i get something uh, so yeah so folk have been saying have i given any thought to <laughs> excited to what i might grow um have i given any thought to what i might grow what do you think <laughs> of course i have I've been dreaming and plotting and planning, you know, ever since the end of May when I said, oh, have I just scratched myself with chickpea? That might irritate. Yeah, I've been plotting and planning and fantasizing and being excited and then telling myself not to be excited because it might all be a disaster or ever since I decided at the end of May to quit this garden. So, uh, yeah, someone said, if you could only have grow in 20 pots, what would you grow? Uh, someone else said if you only if you could only grow vertically or etc etc and you know there's loads of stuff I can take from the, the sort of learning I've done in this garden over the last by the time I leave it'll be 14 15 years or so goodness me I'm surprised I haven't put down roots I have with my heart um, and one of the biggest things is really optimizing the space by growing vertically so you know in the past I talked about I put the beans over the paths so the wasted space between the two rows of beans is the path it's not wasted soil that freed up a whole nother growing bed for me and the year I decided to do that three four years ago was it now uh, wow it revolutionized things for me um, because suddenly I had two whole extra beds and each of my beds it's about three they're about three and a half four meters long there, there's slight variations in all the beds by about a meter sometimes a meter ten wide so to get two of those beds freed up of beans wow it was so much more growing space for me it's brilliant so yeah I would definitely be looking at vertical growing I will definitely be looking at raised beds, but not raised beds as in, you know, a, one scaff plank. I'm talking raised beds that are sort of thigh height, proper raised beds. Um, 
The problem with thinking about all this is I get really, I start to get really excited and picture it and then it's like, yeah, but that's maybe not what you'll get, Vivi. But then on the other hand, I think, yeah, picture it and maybe you can manifest it. <laughs> I don't believe in that, so I don't know why. But um, yeah, so the plan would be raised beds, probably built out of reclaimed brick. So it's really long lasting <sighs> to fill them Hugel culture style and um, so by having the raised beds straight away that removes the whole digging thing for me because I really want to stay in this area and all the gardens in this area they have soil similar to this it's this really really heavy clay which is fantastically nutritious but um, pretty difficult to garden on so yeah proper proper raised beds um, if it's a smallish type of like a patio type garden I think the the plan would be <clears throat> raised beds not maybe a couple of feet deep but around the edge of the entire garden obviously a gap for me to come in from the back door but around the entire garden to really use all you know the, the entire perimeter <clears throat> Then I'd have space in the middle for a little table and chairs, plus some pots here and there. As to what I would actually grow, um, also the, the other thing I was, I was talking with Gary about this just this morning on my way down here. Uh, he's still not turned up, Hope he's all right. Um, if, if the garden is big enough to have more than just raised beds on the perimeter, you know, have another raised bed, in the middle almost like doing a knot garden but out of raised beds but making sure that there's space between the raised beds a for a wheelbarrow <laughs> although in such a small garden i don't think i'd use one but b you know i'm future proofing here um is is it wide enough for a wheelchair because if i live as ripe and as well as auntie teapot one day i'll be in a chair and yeah, I'm thinking about these things now because I'd like to invest what I can from the sale of my property into the next one, but also into the garden to make sure it's a garden I can enjoy and I, I can enjoy for the rest of my life. So yeah, um, spacing out of beds. And then while I'm, st while I'm still young and gorgeous and completely able where things are extra wide I just fill it with pots for now pots troughs what have you what have you future proofing anyway so back to the point what would you actually grow sorry just before I get to that this is something else I'm I often mention and it's particularly pertinent if you're growing for the first time this year yay you know, if this is your first year growing, please, please, please don't be disheartened. It isn't always as shockingly, miserably difficult as it's been this year. I think we are going to have more summers like this, but this has been a particularly horrible year. So, yeah, please don't be put off. Please don't give up. Have another go next year. We might get rain next year. And whilst you're taking your plants out, especially as we move into the autumn and you start pulling things up and clearing things, something I always recommend is have a look at your plant's roots. You know, as a gardener, we want to get to know every single part of our plant as, you know, as well as we possibly can. Um, you know, take time to look at the flowers, <laughs> take time to look at the roots. Because when we look at the roots, so this was the soil level those roots have only gone they've gone a bit sideways unless actually the plant was growing sideways they've gone down about 10 11 centimeters that's all the reason i'm mentioning that is in a year like this you know there are some years where we are getting a bit of rain but you can come to the garden and it looks really dry on the surface but if you put your fingers into the soil if the soil is loose enough or put your trowel into the soil pull it aside a bit you can see oh actually you know eight nine centimeters down there's moisture there so you think oh i don't need to water today we don't want to mollycoddle our plants 
But on the other hand, if you go down, you think, wow, there's no moisture visible, even at 20 centimetres. Knowing that the, the depth of your plant's roots can help you decide what is the most urgent thing to get watered. If water is really scarce and precious, it makes sense, well, it makes sense to look after your expensive crops. So for me, squash and tomatoes, they're expensive to buy. They always get the priority. The potatoes I gave up on, you know what, forget it. But also one way of deciding and prioritizing is thinking about the root depth. So yeah, if you're new this year, as you're pulling all your plants out this autumn, um, just have a look at the roots. Make a mental note. If you need to make a note in your notebook, maybe you, you might even want to, if you've got a little journal, you could photograph the roots next to a ruler, tape measure, stick that in your journal. Become a bit of a scientist about your garden. Okay, back to the point. <laughs> I always get there eventually. So what would I grow in a limited garden? Well, I'm sure many of you can guess that I've got a top three which I can't imagine living without. Not so much as food, but in terms of gardening. Uh, but they are important food for me. Tomatoes. You know, if, there's, if I can only do one pot in my garden, it will be a tomato. That smell, the tomato cares, all of those emotional associations and memories. I've got to have a tomato in my new garden. And if I don't have a garden and I only have a windowsill, by Jove, I'm going to try and grow a tomato on it. So yeah, tomatoes. Again, with my cordon types, because they're going up, 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 up. That's a tiny space that they're all in. Can you see them? I don't even see them from there now. I know we're angled away. And that's 32 plants in really quite a small space. Actually, it's more this year, isn't it? I've got nine in each row instead of eight. So nine, eight, it's 36. So yeah, definitely tomatoes, cordons. Definitely some squash. I could train them up. Um, or, depending on what the floor space is, I could just let them trail all over the floor. And beans. Beans for the protein. And also, just because I love eating beans. So they would be my three priorities. And I'd try to have those if I had these kind of narrowish, built up brick beds around the edge of a small garden. That's what would go in there. But also, because I like my greens as well, I think I'd probably try to grow both some chard and some kale of some description, probably like Cavolo Nero, the Nero de Toscana, because again, as brassicas go, I'm gonna sneeze, hang on. <coughs> my hanky's <coughs> in the shed. Yeah, as Nero de Toscana go, as brassicas go, I beg your pardon, the Nero de, de Toscana actually takes up very little space. It's tall, the leaves grow very much upwards. So even in a little, say, three foot row, you could get, I'd probably try and jam four into a little three foot row. Whereas with a cauliflower, you'd only get one in that space. But the main thing with the um, Cavallo Nero is, of course, it's a cut and come again veg so you harvest the lower leaves um, as they're maturing and at the top it's continuing to this the growing spike is continuing to put new leaves out all the time so yeah in a small garden I think it would have to be um, a cut and come again type veg I mean I've always said that about this garden I've always said it's really small and that's why I do the cut and come again type brassicas um, but you know my new garden <laughs> might only be the size of one of these beds the entire garden so yeah and the chard for the same reason it's a cut and come again plus I think the thing with chard and the cavallo nero actually as as plants in the border they're beautiful you know they're beautiful plants to look at the chard is colourful right through the winter. 
because I think that's the thing with a with a vegetable garden you know it, it gets it does get pretty bare in the winter that doesn't matter when it's the allotment does it but when it's right outside my back door and and let's say it's a door that I can see out of so so there's a view from the living room for example or it might be the bedroom whatever it is but if I'm looking out on a completely bare garden in winter that won't be very nice so yeah something like chard with all its beautiful colors and it's a nice sort of different taste from the kale so that would be it that would be my kind of five veggies to jam into a small space and now we just have to um, hope it happens and hope for this garden this year we get some rain actually do you know what it's like um, oh there's a beautiful line in Sophocles the Greek playwright his version of Electra her her brother is banished and she fears the worst and she's living with her stepmom and the stepmom is horrible and there's this beautiful beautiful speech by Electra really early on and she says um, hang on I've got to remember it now yeah she's talking about wanting her brother to come back to a rescue her b banish the stepmother and c you know put everything right and she says um i have hoped and hoped until all the hope i ever had is gone oh oh god it's pitiful i won't give away the ending if anyone wants to go and not necessarily watch it but read it if you like if you like reading plays read sophocles electra it's just stunningly beautiful ah oh, i want to do the whole that whole speech at the beginning when she's um she's being told how to behave and it's the most wonderful actually we could all say it to politicians now it's the sort of she's saying don't you dare tell me how, how to behave when you behave so abysmally yourself anyway how did i get onto sophocles Electra? oh yeah rain <laughs> i was thinking this the other day i was thinking i have hoped and hoped for rain until all the hope i ever had is gone <laughs> i you know, I just don't see us getting any rain now until the season is over. I don't mean that in a miserable way. <laughs> I just mean, you know what? <sighs> yeah, you can hope for something, but in the meantime, don't wait, act. In other words, keep doing the watering. And speaking of water, I think I need to have some more for myself. So yeah, this, like I said, the, with the chickpeas, just doing this with them. I'll take them, oops, broke a cane. Uh, the, the little cane, my little wattle hedging worked a treat. Why have I waited till my last year to do it? Uh, yeah, they'll come home. I'll do it at home, pod them in my lap. They do take an age and I've always said that you probably can, you probably burn more calories podding them than you do, than you get calories from eating them, but they're gorgeous and worth it. Do it with the radio on, do it while you're chatting with friends. There was one, <laughs> I took a bucket of them to the pub. I was supposed to be meeting friends at the pub and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take my chickpeas, I'm gonna harvest, I'll pod my chickpeas in the pub with my mates. It was great, except they scoffed half of them. <laughs> um, and there's a lovely, they give off this lovely sort of zingy, almost citrusy smell. Um, so yeah, I'll have gorgeous smelling fingers afterwards. Just down here as well to say, because I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to plant, I'm not going to plant the celery today. I didn't strip that very well. Can you hear Rosie calling? No, no, no. Um... I'm not going to plant the celery today and normally you'd think oh no bare ground in this heat but actually there's so much there's so much nasturtium tailing that it's you know it's it's protecting the ground a little bit 
and then when I come to put the celery in, I'll, I'll dot it between. I'll leave the nasturtium for now because they're kind of acting as a bit of mulch, a bit of shade, and I think the celery will appreciate that. I've got to get some water. <sighs> Was not expecting this heat today, never mind. And I realised I've yacked for ages, but it's kind of fun to think about, speculate, dream about another garden, isn't it? It's great to get the tomato cares done because it looks like they are going to be a good harvest this year. So I really want to, you know, give them good care, give them the best possible chance. I'm going to finish the chickpea harvest and then I've got to water. I've got to do all the watering. So all the things I thought I was going to get to today, they're going to have to wait till tomorrow. But that's fine. Rome wasn't built in a day and I'm sure it wasn't harvested in a day either. Hopefully tomorrow <laughs> there's a bit more cloud cover and it's a bit cooler and actually I'll just come, <clears throat> I'm going to come to the garden earlier. That's the thing about this forecasting. I didn't come at the crack of dawn because it was supposed to be, like I said, it wasn't supposed to be hot in the middle of the day, but it is. It's half past two and it's boiling. Scorchio! So I'm going to say cheerio to you all for now. I'll see you again soon. Um, there's a few videos coming up from indoors at home that I've, a couple of things I've filmed uh, whilst I've been indoors keeping away from the heat. We'll do the lavender harvest and the pruning. That's a really important bit. Well, they're both important, aren't they? We'll do some or all of that in the next few days. So until then, please look after yourselves. <laughs> Stay somewhere in the shade if you possibly can, but at the same time, try and embrace it because, oh, for all of us summer babies, we're at that time of year and we know it's just starting. I know it doesn't feel like it on a day like today, but it is starting to ebb away and the lushness of the gardens start to fade. We haven't had the lushness this year. It's been faded all year, but yeah, if you're a summer baby, um, if you can try and make the most of these last few days, weeks of summer and try not to think about what's coming because we don't like it, do we? Whilst there'll be some people who are gagging for winter. And likewise to all our Antipodean friends, hello down under. You're all just starting to get really excited, aren't you, about spring. Everybody, be happy. Look after yourselves. Look after each other. Smile at strangers. Find joy every day. Cheerio.